It is my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He is a board certified cardiologist with years of experience in the latest medical practices and nutritional health. He is a clinical assistant professor of medicine in the division of cardiology at the University of Texas in Houston, a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the founder and medical director of the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center. Having seen many patients suffer the consequences of chronic heart disease, Dr. Montgomery founded the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center in 1987, excuse me, 1997, with the mission to reverse and prevent life-threatening illnesses. It's located in Houston, Texas, and is a state-of-the-art health center complete with technology and resources to provide comprehensive medical and wellness care. Combining his medical practice with a food-driven lifestyle intervention, Dr. Montgomery introduces patients to a novel food prescription plan that helps reverse chronic conditions such as heart disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and diabetes without medication or surgeries. That's important, guys. So Dr. Montgomery is going to share his revolutionary treatment approach on a docu-series that you'll hear about. It's called Heart and Soul of the Champion. The first season follows NFL legends throughout the course of their treatment, including Hall of Fame inductee Daryl Green. But the most profound case featured is that of an average Joe whose heart was failing and struggling to pump at 10% efficiency. Yet he too is on the road to recovery now when others' doctors had written him off completely. So welcome, Dr. Montgomery. We are so pleased to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, it's always a pleasure to share this insight. This is uh, my, my um, not only my career, but my passion, and maybe even I consider it as my ministry. So without further ado, I'm going to share <clears throat> my screen with you. And I want to start off this discussion. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about the approach that we take. And I want to share with you uh, information about uh, Heart and Soul of a Champion, which is a docu-series that actually uh, outlines this in art form. But uh, I want to talk about the concept of integrative health, uh, which we use nutrition as a foundation of integrative health. And I think it's the future of medicine. In fact, I know it's the future of medicine. It needs to be the future of medicine or else we're going to be in big trouble. So I want to share a few slides on that. And then I want to get into the nuts and bolts of how nutrition uh, works and how effective it is and how it works at the cellular level. First and foremost, I want uh, to make us all aware of the fact that we're currently in a healthcare crisis. Uh, this graph here shows how life expectancy from 1995 up until around 2014 was on a steady increase for the most part. In 2014, there was a little bit of a plateau, maybe a slight dip. Uh, but in 2019, we started having a nosedive from 2019 to 2020. And from 2020 to 2021, we had a nosedive and drop in life expectancy. In this two-year period of time, it, life expectancy in the United States decreased by about 2.7 years. Um, and we, we, it's something that we all inherently know, but I don't think it's something that we think about uh, so much consciously, but sickness is the norm. And looking at cardiovascular disease alone, uh, in 2019, there were about 874,000 deaths from cardiovascular diseases. And to compare this to a recent pandemic that really caught all of our attention, uh, globally in 2020, cardiovascular disease was responsible for over 19 million deaths, while at the same time, COVID-19 was responsible for about 6.7 million deaths. So uh, despite how horrific uh, the COVID pandemic was, uh, cardiovascular disease was almost three times uh, as deadly, and cardiovascular disease does this every year. Uh, 
uh, from 2015 to 2018, it affected Black males and females at about the rate of 60%. Uh, the leading cause of cardiovascular disease in 2019 were the usual suspects, coronary heart disease, uh, other forms of cardiovascular disease, stroke, high blood pressure, heart failure, <clears throat> and other disease of the artery. These may include inflammatory diseases. Uh, the cost is, is uh, astronomical. If we look at this graph here that shows the military deaths of all the wars that we fought in the United States from 1775 to 2022, it outlines the military deaths and gives you some perspective with the American Civil War having 620,000 deaths, the World War II, 400,000 deaths and on down. If you were to take those uh, military deaths all combined, and let's compare them to the deaths that we have from cardiovascular disease and cancer every year. Uh, and these are the two top causes of death. You see that the cause of death from cardiovascular disease and cancer combined account for more deaths each year than all of the deaths we had from all of the, all of the military deaths we had from all the wars we fought in US history. The, the number is about 1.3 million deaths from all the military deaths compared to about 1.4 million deaths from heart disease and cancer every year. So it's almost as though, or I should say, it's as though we're fighting all the wars in US history every year and having all those casualties just for the two top, top two causes of chronic illnesses, which are mostly uh, uh, reversible or preventable uh, by heart disease. And as I mentioned earlier, by, by lifestyle changes. As I mentioned earlier, uh, life expectancy decreased by about 2.7 years uh, from 2019 to 2020. About six in 10 US citizens suffer from at least one chronic illness. So that's a level of debilitation that we suffer. And it costs us somewhere on about uh, on the level of about $3.8 trillion, which is 20% of our gross domestic product. So there's a human cost, there's a, a cost, for example, in human life loss, suff human suffrage, and of course, the monetary co cost. So, Needless to say, that a paradigm shift is needed. And my theory and my uh, argument, and I can make a strong case for it, is that lifestyle intervention is that paradigm shift. And my statement here is simple. Lifestyle intervention should be the first line treatment of choice for both prevention, control, and reversal of chronic illness. Now, not only do I stop at prevention, but we can control chronic illness and also reverse chronic illness. And so uh, the next part of my presentation is gonna go into how lifestyle intervention can be uh, implemented <clears throat> in some of the most acutely ill uh, patients that we see. Now, if we think of nutrition uh, as an acute cardiac and medical intervention, most people think of nutrition in a sense that, well, you know, if I eat, you know, some broccoli today, maybe in 20 years, something good may happen. <clears throat> However, uh, you can start a nutrition intervention right in the throes, uh, right when someone is in the throes of an acute illness. And I'm going to share some of the uh, science behind it and give you one case presentation that demonstrates how that's done. If you look at the underlying processes of chronic illness, there are two mechanisms I speak of, and really there should be a third mechanism I'll mention. Uh, one mechanism is inflammation. Uh, inflammation can be thought of as a biochemical fire. Uh, chronic inflammation undergirds virtually all of the chronic illnesses that we know of, as you see here, cancer, neurological disease, pulmonary diseases, bone and joint diseases, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, and the like. And, and this underlying chronic inflammatory process is a process that is a smoldering fire, if you will, that leads to the slow progression of organ dysfunction and organ degeneration and eventually organ failure. And this is what, what maintains, uh, one of the main things that maintains uh, our chronic illness and the, how our body breaks down. Oxidative stress is another mechanism. And the way to think of oxidative stress is simply a toxic chemical buildup. Uh, most of us are familiar with how an apple, you slice it in half, you sit it on the counter, you can see it turn brown. That's due to oxidative stress. A similar thing happened at the cellular level. And, and at the cellular level, subcellular level, you have molecules called free radicals uh, that are missing an electron. These free radicals uh, are unstable. 
uh, and they can lead to damage to DNA, cellular membranes and the like. And so lots of free radicals that are floating around causing damage to our tissue. And again, contributing to this underlying uh, breakdown and, and increased oxidative stress is, is due to increased free radicals. And the way you stabilize these free radicals, you bring in antioxidants. What are antioxidants? Well, plant foods are antioxidants. There are many other types of antioxidants. So increased oxidative stress and inflammation play have an interplay between each other, and they lead to this chronic breakdown and flare-ups in inflammation or flare-ups in oxidative stress leads to acute illnesses. And when these acute illnesses occur, that's when someone has to be admitted to the hospital emergently. And I'll share some of those mechanisms with you. The third component, which I think possibly even undergirds these two, is a disruption of the microbiome. And uh, that is the um, ecosystem, if you will. A big part of it is in the GI tract, but it's in other parts of our body. But we live in the ecosystem of bacteria and viruses that they are healthy uh, microbes that live symbolic, uh, symbiotically with us, that helps us with our immune system, with our digestion. Uh, and when this ecosystem is disrupted uh, by poor diet and toxic chemicals that are brought into our system, mm. that also contributes to chronic illness as well as um, um, chronic illness as well as acute inflammatory conditions. So acute and chronic illness, mechanisms of inflammation, uh, I'm going to show a few slides that are a little bit technical, but I'm going to walk you through it. I think it's important for us to get a little bit in the weeds here, but I promise you I'm going to bring this uh, to light and make it uh, and connect the dots. So when we think of inflammation of the heart, you have uh, inflammation that leads to uh, heart failure. Uh, heart failure is the, body's in, the heart's inability to circulate blood commiserate to the body's needs. So the heart can be either too weak or too stiff. So a heart that becomes inflamed uh, can become, it can cause a heart to be weakened so the muscle doesn't contract adequately. Also an inflamed heart can be a heart that's not stiff, that's too stiff rather, that doesn't allow filling. So it doesn't allow filling of blood or fluid. So that leads to inadequate circulation as well. So we think of these uh, terms cytokines. Now many of you may remember hearing about individuals with COVID infection going into cytokine storms. Well, that's nothing unique to uh, uh, COVID infection or any infection. Cytokine storms uh, uh, occur in many situations where someone's acutely ill. So you affect, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines are seen in patients with heart disease. Uh, these inflammatory cytokines have special names to some of them, IL-1 uh, beta, TNF-alpha. Uh, we see these cytokines that are increased in uh, people with heart failure. Acute heart failure, when somebody becomes decompensated, has to be rushed to the hospital, essentially is a cytokine storm as a cardiovascular system. So uh, you can look at inflammation in the endothelium, and the endothelial system is the main compartment of the blood vessels or the circulatory system. So inflammation in the coronary microvascular endothelium cause reduction of molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a special molecule that allows arteries to open up. It helps improve circulation. So not only does it affect the circulation within the heart itself, but it can affect circulation in the brain, circulation in the kidneys, and other parts of the body where circulation is important, which is essentially everywhere. So reduction of nitric oxide have a twofold effect on the heart. There's this uh, uh, structure called Titan, and basically, this is the, the underlying structure of the heart, sort of like if you think of a house that has uh, frames uh, and, and the, the frame of the house that holds the house together, the heart has a similar structure. It's a cytoskeletal protein. But if this cytoskeletal protein doesn't have adequate phosphorylation, uh, then it becomes very stiff. When this protein becomes stiff, then the heart becomes very stiff. Another mechanism is that the heart becomes thickened when nitric oxide is not present. So we call it cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. Uh, and again, the heart's not able to relax adequately. So again, a heart that's too stiff doesn't circulate blood adequately. Um, another mechanism, inflammation uh, in the uh, lining of the cells uh, cause adhesion molecules. Adhesion molecules are signaling molecules that uh, uh, show up on cells and they identify these cells to be sick they will signal the immune system to come and destroy these cells. 
So you can have cell destruction, which then leads to scarring uh, in the heart. So you have decreased heart cell muscles, uh, increased heart cell scarring, and the microvasculature or the small blood vessels that feed blood to the heart can also become impaired. So it's a very complex set of uh, a cascade of events that occur, but all these are underscored by this inflammatory process that happens at the level of the endothelial cells, which affects blood, uh, blood vessel uh, function and heart circulation. Uh, innate immune system plays a role. So when you have increased inflammation, your immune system not only works uh, uh, excessively, but it works against you. So the immune system, when it's in inflamed and has increased oxidative stress or also increased um, uh, toxins, the immune system is also revved up. So you activate the innate immune system, uh, you form a lot of different uh, uh, organs, uh, uh, cells that cause myocarditis, it cause ischemia, uh, perfusion injury. Uh, that ischemia means a lack of circulation, a lack of oxygen. It can affect the aortic valve, it can affect blood vessel causing hypertension. Uh, it can cause plaque formation or plaque rupture, which can lead to heart attacks. So the different molecules in the innate immune system that cause stressors, that cause blood vessels to constrict, it cause a suffocation of heart muscle, and it cause reduction in circulation and a reduction in heart function. How about oxidative stress? As I said, oxidative stress is a buildup of toxic chemicals. How does this affect the heart directly? Well, toxic chemicals, there are other names for them, reactive oxygen species, Again, this is a fancy medical term where you have certain types of molecules that can have an adverse effect on some of the, the, the mechanism of how the heart works. Let's look at cardiomyocyte electrophysiology. This is the electrical system of the heart. If the heart's electrical system is impaired, you can have cardiac arrhythmias. So for example, reactive oxygen species can reduce the function of a special sodium calcium channel that leads to increased calcium influx. And this leads to increase in calcium and L-type uh, calcium channels. That's a, that's a mouthful, but what does that predispose? That predispose the arrhythmias called, called atrial fibrillation. It can also predispose ventricular arrhythmias. So if you have a heart that's in, in oxidative stress and, and you have increased toxic chemicals by whatever mechanism, it can predispose to cardiac arrhythmias. You're seeing lots of individuals, young individuals dying sudden death. Uh, an individual had a cardiac arrest uh, while playing an NFL football. Well, if you have an increased reactive oxygen species when you're exerting yourself, that can predispose to atrial arrhythmias, but also more life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, reactive oxygen species uh, results in uh, leading to contractile dysfunction. Contractile function is how the heart beats. So if the heart has contractile dysfunction, its pumping function is impaired. And so reactive oxygen species, again, one type of toxic chemical results in the heart function not working. And of course, mitochondria are very important uh, and their function is impaired when you have excess reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species also results in increased fibrosis or scarring of the heart. So here you have these two mechanisms that contribute to different ways that the heart breaks down. One, the electrical system can be damaged. Two, the contractile pumping function can be damaged. Three, the intracellular mitochondrial function, which causes energy production, can be damaged. And then four, you can result in increase in fibrosis or scarring of the heart. So, what are some of the general benefits of plant-based nutrition? I, I said a mouthful, there are a lot of uh, detailed biochemical pathways there. And we're gonna talk about how um, nutrition actually has an interplay to, to intersect these mechanisms and can reverse them. But first of all, general benefits, here's an article that shows how a low carbohydrate plant diet compared to an animal diet, a plant-based diet has been shown to reduce the great adherence to a low carbohydrate uh, plant diet is associated with lower or, or animal fat diet associated with all cause mortality increase after a heart attack. So basically with this study, showed an individual on a low carbohydrate plant diet 
after suffering a heart attack essentially did better in terms of all-cause mortality compared to individuals on a low-carbohydrate diet that was animal-based. And so that's sort of a, a scientific study that shows in the population, we see better survival in people with cardiovascular disease on a plant-based diet. So let's look at uh, this situation with one patient that had severe um, uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is a 66-year-old lady with congestive heart failure. She had severe mitral valve regurgitation. She had a, a defibrillator implanted, and she was admitted to the hospital for worsening heart failure. Now, her condition was attributed to worsening mitral regurgitation. One other piece of information that's not on the slide that I'll share with you, this patient also had a condition known as lupus, which is a systemic inflammatory condition, and she seemed to have been in a lupus flare, and I'll show that in some of the other slides. But the echocardiogram showed that the heart was very weak, and you see, you're going to see a lot of color going back here. That's a lot of blood going back in this left atrium. Uh, this left ventricle is dilated, and uh, the heart's very weak, as you can see here, uh, and uh, the valve is uh, not functioning uh, effectively. Um, there's another image here. And you got there. Okay, so what was her hospital course? She was admitted to the hospital, started on intravenous diuretics. She was volume overloaded. Uh, she had episodes of worsening cardiac arrhythmias. Now remember, she was having a, a lupus flare. Uh, and remember some of the other slides, I'll talk about increased inflammation and increased oxidative stress, how it contributes to arrhythmias like atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. So she had worsening of arrhythmias. Uh, tachycardia means fast heart rate. Her heart failure was worsening. Uh, and so we had to admit her to the CCU shortly after admitting to the hospital uh, because the condition decompensated within the first you know, 24 hours of being in the hospital. Uh, so because she had severe mitral regurgitation, uh, I consulted uh, my colleagues on the structural heart team. and um, we wanted to evaluate whether we can do what's called a mitral clip and reduce some of the uh, regurgitation uh, of her mitral valve. And if we can do that, we can probably decrease some of the leakage. So this is a, a minimally invasive uh, procedure that can be done with a catheter. We didn't have to open the chest. Uh, so um, my colleagues saw her uh, and basically they deemed that she was too sick for the procedure. Uh, it wouldn't be a benefit. As I said, she had comorbidities. She had, you know, lupus. She was in a lupus flare. Uh, and they basically said um, uh, it wouldn't benefit and she, we should just go ahead and let her die. I had one of my uh, electrophysiology consultant colleagues who does procedures for me uh, ask her to evaluate her for placing a biventricular pacing uh, defibrillator device to improve her cardiac function because she did have an electrical disorder that would be amenable to that. Uh, but she apparently probably read the uh, structural heart disease uh, uh, team note and she deemed the patient too sick to undergo that procedure. So basically the patient was too sick uh, to undergo the uh, procedure. So essentially what we did, we called the palliative medicine team in. Uh, they consulted on the patient. They said they recommended to optimize the medications and they recommend discharging the patient to a hospice facility. And the discharge medications, the hospital can be vitamin C, a diuretic furosemide, hydroxychloroquine, that was for her lupus. We had on a milanone infusion. A uh, milanone is a blood that we give, uh, excuse me, a medication we give patients who are in dire straits, you know, they're near the end with heart failure. And we're just trying to squeeze the last bit of cardiac function. Uh, she was on pentoprazole and sodalol was for the arrhythmia. So uh, we discharged her. However, the hospice team, they didn't communicate with us properly, but uh, once we discharged her, they said, well, we couldn't manage the millinone pump, so we can't have her in hospice. So they sent her back to the hospital. Uh, so I saw the patient in, in the unit and uh, she was actually at tears. So we saying the pediatra team said, look, we're gonna have to stop the millinone pump. We're gonna have to let you die here. Uh, so just order your last meal. Uh, we'll stop the pump and, and we'll let you go. So, you know, again, readmitted within 24 hours. 
Uh, and so it was determined she couldn't be sent to any hospital in Middle Known, and the parents of team recommended that we discontinue Middle Known and let her die in the hospital. So I spoke to the patient. I said, look, here, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, drop your tears. Uh, we're going to start a nutritional detox. Uh, spoke to the um, hospital team. I said, give me seven days. And we start on the detox. So we discussed things with the case management, asked for seven days, uh, and we worked with the patient, showing a successful detox, and we were able to wean the melanoma pump off within seven days, and we weaned other medications. And uh, she was able to not only go home, but she went to hospice and then was able to be discharged from hospice and went home after that. Uh, she was only discharged on one diuretic at a very low dose on an as-needed basis. Uh, and uh, I'll go over some of the clinical data in the hospital course. There's some, uh, uh, excuse the business of the slide. Serum creatinine is a, a, a protein we measure in the blood. The higher the creatinine, the lower the kidney function, the lower the creatinine, the better the kidney function. So the kidney function bounced around early on because of her cardiac condition, you know, uh, um, fluctuated. Uh, uh, we got on the melanone and stabilized the kidney function, but when she was discharged, they stopped the melanone transiting. We put her back on melanone, but we were able to wean her off melanone. So these are the last days we weaned off the melanone, the kidney function stayed normal uh, after being discharged. Uh, GFR is glomerular filtration rate. Uh, it improved on the melanone, and then uh, it got worse when she got very ill in the units. We got a rhythm under control, it got better. And then when we had on the melanone, we discharged her uh, and it got worse after they stopped the melanone when she was discharged at the hospice unit. She came back, we started the melanone back, but then we were able to wean the melanone and the kidney function remained good up here. Uh, lactic acid builds up when circulation is down. Since so you had high lactic acid level here, here's where we start the detox. The lactic acid level was high and then it went down very soon after the detox. So this showed that uh, liver function tests improved and remained normal, and same thing here. Uh, so this essentially showed how the patient improved early on. Uh, she was discharged, and when she was discharged, her inflammation went up. We started to detox. This little gold bar, uh, uh, orange bar here, shows the time we start to detox. Inflammation went up, but then it came down rapidly after the detox. So the initial discharge medicine, we initially sent her out to go to hospice. This was a medication list. She came back. After the detox, we were able to discharge her only on one medication. The patient was able to walk and uh, on her own. And actually, we had her doing some exercise in the office uh, even after she was discharged from hospice. Six medications down to one. So the power of nutrition uh, demonstrated itself there. And we have many other cases that we can discuss. Key reason for the patient decompensation, uh, she was on a suboptimal plant-based nutritional regimen. Now the patient said she was vegetarian, but she was eating some animal protein in form of cheese or dairy, plus she ate a lot of processed uh, plant foods. Um, she had severe mitral valve insufficiency in large part due to the heart failure and inflammatory condition. She had an atrial tachycardia, which again made things worse. And she had a cardiac conduction abnormality, the atrial fibrillation, as well as the bundle branch block. These things made her cardiac circulation less efficient. And the systemic inflammatory flare of her lupus, again, just poured fire on everything. So essentially, key reason for recovery, the nutritional detox essentially helped reverse a lot of these things. Some of the mechanism by reducing inflammation of the lupus flare, allow for the heart rhythm to normalize, uh, it also allowed for the valve, which was inflamed, to probably function more normally. Uh, and uh, also cardiac muscle. Remember, it's those mechanisms I went through with you in terms of if you have increased inflammation, increased oxidative stress, the heart cells don't work well because at the cellular level, you have dysfunction at the cellular level, plus at the tissue level, circulation to the heart muscle is inadequate, so the heart muscle itself is suffocating. So when you give the heart, the body, optimal nutrition, it's sort of like putting out a fire. And when you put the fire out, then the heart no longer suffocates and the body's other organs no longer suffocate and they start to function normal. So my last little section here, I want to talk about integrative health as a whole.
Uh, so here we talk about an acute, using nutrition as an acute intervention, uh, but nutrition is part of a, a comprehensive uh, intervention that we use in our center uh, and we refer to it as integrative health. Integrative health starts with foundational optimal nutrition, uh, as I like to emphasize always, and there are other natural interventions that are added uh, as indicated as the, the, the pyramid shows here, we start with nutrition and it's a defined food prescription. I don't just say, well, eat plant-based or, or eat healthy or be careful. We're very precise in terms of what we recommend, how the foods are prepared, et cetera. Uh, target nutrient supplement, uh, supplementation is used. Fitness assessments are prescribed. These things are used uh, synergistically. Uh, physiological functional correction. Uh, and we fine tune all the interventions. Um, uh, we use a number of things like fasting, uh, uh, detox, there's educational component to it because many people have to get over the psychological aspect of making fundamental changes in how they eat. Uh, we help them with recipes and practical guides in terms of shopping. Uh, we use, you know, uh, microbiome testing, intravenous infusions. We use ozone infusions, IV vitamin C and the like, the oral supplementation that's used. Uh, and again, we have trainers uh, on standby. We have fitness, uh, our, our patients are workout at the gym. Uh, and we take them in, uh, uh, as I like to tell them, we kick their butts out on the, in the gym and the, the sports field. Uh, but that's also beneficial physiologically uh, as well as psychologically. And we use other modalities such as acupuncture and uh, chiropractic. And all of these things are integrated together under one roof. Oftentimes people... When they're trying to make changes, they may do a little bit here, maybe a little bit there, but we help them put it all together. Uh, so that's the integrative approach we use. And it's my strong opinion that that's the approach that we like to take. So uh, before I get to questions, I want to share with you, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to share with you uh, our doc series. So Heart and Soul of a Champion is the name of an integrative approach that you use. Uh, but it's also the name of uh, the art form of a docu-series that we just released. Uh, and you can go to heartandsoulofachampion.com. I'm going to share that in the chat and hopefully I'll share that with the group. But let me um, uh, show you the uh, trailer. So let me share my screen again here. And I saved a lot of time for questions and answers, which I like. I'm Dr. Baxter Montgomery, and I've been practicing the world's largest medical center for more than a quarter of a century. Over the 25 years of practicing cardiology and internal medicine, I've treated patients with many, many advanced diseases. We had three hospitals in Virginia that said no. We had one in Richmond, Virginia that said, his heart's too bad, we're not gonna take the chance. So we said, come here, whatever it takes. The body has the ability to heal itself when properly nourished, rested, and hydrated. We know this is effective in getting people back on their feet. So we brought together a group of athletes who had performed at peak levels at some time in their lives. They're coming in with chronic ailments such as high blood pressure, heart failure, arthritis, and many other chronic illnesses. I was going to the doctor regularly. We did a biopsy and the biopsy came back as positive for prostate cancer. At that point, I was like, oh my gosh. Mr. Kitty Banks has a condition that can take his life suddenly at any moment, and he's not aware of it. You think he's at risk for a heart attack? He definitely could be. I came here to run a 4-4 or better 40 yard dash at 63. And so sure enough, we are going through the program and turned out I've had some issues. When a patient comes with a blood pressure, it's 191 over 114. This is a blood pressure that's at a level that's considered stroke level. This is a medical emergency. One minute they're up talking to you, the other minute they collapse in death. It was just a lot of unknown uncertainties. What did that mean, congestive heart failure? Is my, I'm gonna have a heart attack? Is my heart gonna stop working? It's a combination of all those things that could happen. If you can go back and turn the clock, go back to a time where you were at your peak performance, would you do that? This is Heart and Soul of a Champion, Athletes Edition, Season One. Know that it can be done. That's the heart of the champion. 
the heart and soul of the champion. Okay, and I will do my final screen share where I show you. I want to show you the website, if you will. Hold on one second here. And the uh, website's heartsoulofthechampion.com. Um, you can go to the site. Um, if you enter your name and email address here, you can get the first episode free. Uh, you can see the trailer on the site. And um, the site has a lot of information. It talks about us and it tells you, uh, give you information about Heart and Soul of the Champion and the uh, motivation behind it. Uh, I invite each one of you to go and take a look at the website, uh, take a look at um, episode one and by all means uh, buy it and share it. You can also purchase it as a gift. Uh, it's designed to uh, inform, inspire, and entertain all at the same time. So I hope you enjoy. I think I'm good for questions or comments. Okay, well, Dr. Montgomery, I am first, and I'm thrilled that I'm first because there's other questions. But um, I did spend the afternoon on your website. I did watch the docu, the first part of the docu series, and it was excellent. Um, as I was looking at your site and going through everything, what I heard is that you are in the center of three different mm -hmm. transplant centers, right? Yeah, we're close. We're four miles south of the Texas Medical Center. That's the world's largest medical center. Houston is kind of, it has a lot of things. I mean, everything's big in Texas, I guess. But, you know, in Houston, our largest medical center is the largest in the world. But we have many other medical centers in the surrounding parts of Houston that are larger than many, most medical centers around the country. And in the Texas Medical Center, there are three transplant centers which are in walking distance. So we're just four miles south of that. I refer to them as Goliath and we're David. <laughs> okay, so the, you know, we hear the folks that are really involved in a whole food plant-based program, we hear all the time that medical doctors do not have the nutritional background that they should have. So my question to you is, how did all of those Goliaths respond to or react to what you were doing? Especially, you know, like the lady that they've given up on and, she, you know, they're, they basically told her to go home and die and you bring her back. And, and so how, how are they responding to that? You know, and do you have your slingshot out and ready to conquer? We're still working on our uh, optimizing our swing side, but no, that's a great question. Um, first, I'll say that the, the quick response is I don't know what they say behind my back. However, uh, I've gotten a few positive responses uh, 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 to my face. So, for example, I have presented our data uh, to a number of grand rounds. I presented to the cardiovascular surgeons on two occasions at the medical center. I presented to a group of uh, obstetrics and gynecology uh, physicians. I presented to uh, a group of psychiatrists uh, at Meharry Medical School. So I presented this data uh, that we have because our, our data is published in a, in a medical literature. So this is one thing that gives us solid footing. So this isn't just, you know, hocus pocus. Hey, I saw this one patient got better. The scientific background is there. The biochemical mechanisms are, are well-defined. And, and the scientific work has been done and we continue to work. I have an IB approval for another study that I plan to launch. So we have a lot of work that we've done and a lot of work yet to do. Um, but some of the response is that uh, my colleagues will refer patients. You know, one of the surgeons referred a patient who had a complication of a heart cath, said a dissected aorta. Uh, he asked, was asked to see the patient to determine whether she needed surgery, she didn't. Uh, but the patient and their family said, well, look, is there anything natural that we can do? And of course, with him knowing about what we do, uh, he got on the phone and called me and said, look, I have a patient for you. And, you know, and awesome. so he referred uh, another cardiology colleague refers patients who 
Um, you know, he wasn't a believer at first in use of plant-based nutrition. Now, if any of his patients uh, needs a stent or bypass, he says he'll tell them at least they need to go on a plant-based diet. Uh, many of his patients with uh, lots of comorbidities and metabolic syndrome, he'll refer to us uh, for our program. So a number of my colleagues have, uh, you know, been um, uh, um, receptive to at least referring patients. Um, you know, I for a long time before I started doing this, you know, I'm I was heavily entrenched and I'm, I'm not only internal medicine certified, but cardiology and I'm the cardiac electrophysiologist. So I'm the, uh, you know, the cardiac electrophysiology, we're at the top of the, 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 the pole, if you will, and the cardiology refer patients to us. And so I was entrenched in the system and, you know, super subspecialized and, and doing, you know, very complex procedures and, and one of the most, uh, you know, competitive cardiovascular environment on the planet. And so I became, I earned my chops, if you will. And then when I discovered the real way of helping people, uh, when I made this change, you know, I had already earned their respect, if you will. Uh, and so it's hard to sort of, you know, turn back from that. So I think, you know, there's some, some mixed feelings, I imagine, say, well, Montgomery has lost his mind, or, you know, maybe he's doing something okay, but I'm not sure exactly what they say behind my back. <laughs> okay, so the part two of this question is, the lady that was in the hospital that they gave up for dead, she was in the hospital and she got the nutritional intervention there. Mm -hmm. um, it, do you have a residential center? Because I know the first part of your detox is very rigorous. So I'm just wondering, um, do you trust these people to be um, doing this on their own? Well, what we did in the hospital for her is that first I said, don't eat the hospital food. And we had a daughter pick up food from our nutrition center, or many times I would take food to her. So I would take smoothies. I have my staff made smoothies, super green with super greens in them and blue green algae uh, or salads and the like. And so she ate food just from our nutrition center. So either her daughter would take it to her, or I would take it to her, but that's the thing. And we do that routinely with patients who want to be compliant. Now, some patients don't want to be compliant. That's another story. Uh, but many patients are on our program. They will have family members ship food. They may be on a meal plan. We'll get a refrigerator in their room and they're only eating our food. So, uh, and we've detoxed a number of patients in the hospital on our nutritional regimen, but that's a great question. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think, I, oh, yeah, sorry, I Kathy. Um, Alberta. Well, first of all, that case study said it all. I mean, how can you argue with that? That was just fantastic. Um, Alberta wants to know that once the heart hardens, can it soften back to normal using your nutritional approach? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the answer is, generally speaking, yes. Now, you know, to what extent it reverses and how fast is always the question. And, you know, we see reverse a lot of cases. Now, we've been challenged with some very, very severe conditions where we have to use other modalities. In addition to nutrition, we use ozone, we use infrared sauna. Uh, and, and we've had situations where, you know, the condition, uh, patient comes on the condition, uh, it, they come along too late in the condition, or we don't have the right modality at the right time. And we've learned over the years, and we've been doing this for uh, uh, for about two decades. And, and I'll have to be honest, you know, there was sometimes they came along and, and we didn't have our act together. And we had a patient very, very sick and we just didn't have things together in time. We've learned from those patients. And so the answer is we, uh, by and large, you know, we've seen virtually any condition reverse um, if we catch it in time. But even people on life support, even patients, who in this patient's case, who was given up for hospice, uh, you know, given the adequate time, a week, two weeks, three weeks, if we do the right thing, they can turn around. And she turned around in just seven days. And usually the first seven to 10 days, we can start to see a significant enough turnaround improvement to where we can get them to the next level. Linda, did you have a question? Yes, let me get my mute. I was muted, I'm sorry. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there's a question in the chat box about your thoughts 
on the CIMT, I guess it's carotid and media thickness test, <clears throat> and comparing that to the coronary artery, artery calcium score test. So basically, um, they give you two different types of information. And, you know, the, cal the coronary calcium score looks at the amount of calcification in coronary arteries. And clearly, if you have lots of calcification, there's a, there's a sign that you have, you know, advanced atherosclerosis. Now, the higher you score, uh, there's a correlation with, you know, outcomes or severe disease or chronicity of disease. Um, uh, interval medial thickness, again, it really looks at, you know, inflammation or, or, or thickening or hypertrophy uh, of the lining of the carotid arteries. Uh, and, and many people who have atherosclerosis, some will have a greater manifestation in the coronary system than the cerebrovascular system. Some have greater manifestation in the periphery, the lower extremities, than the heart. And some may have just uh, balance or diffuse manifestation of atherosclerosis. So, you know, someone that may have severe peripheral vascular disease may not have advanced coronary disease. And someone with advanced coronary disease may not have advanced peripheral vascular disease. And someone that has advanced cerebral vascular disease may not have advanced coronary disease. So, you can have a differential manifestation uh, of atherosclerosis in one territory compared to the other. Um, there are probably genetic inputs to this. There may be other factors, uh, but uh, carotid medial interval thickening uh, shows uh, early disease in the cerebral vascular space, uh, as opposed to calcium scores. You're looking at coronary calcium score, it looks at coronary. So there are two different territories. That's one difference. Uh, and there are two different ways of looking at uh, atherosclerotic disease in those two different territories. Great. Uh, by the way, the group feels very honored that you did this presentation for us. There are lots of new information and you, you respected us by giving us some really technical information. Thank you. Um, that was in the chat. We had okay. Vivian who wanted to know, um, how do you schedule a consultation with you? She's excited. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you can go to MontgomeryHeart.com. Let me share our phone number in the chat. Uh, and um, I'm just going to type the number here. And then um, excuse the brevity of it. But uh, also, you can go to our website. Uh, you can also email us at, let me see here, hold on. Uh, you can email us at support at montgomeryheart.com and um, you can also just go to our website there is a location on our website we also have ways of um, we have an online uh, community uh, and so people who are not able to come to Houston uh, can join our community and I'll share some of those links uh, in the chat so uh, here's a link to our website uh, I'll share in the chat. And uh, this is the main website, it's MontgomeryHeart.com. And then if you want to learn about our community, so our community, we uh, have patients, uh, the Montgomery Heart and Wells Optimal Health Journey Community uh, is where you can join anywhere in the world. We have people from Australia, Canada, everywhere who are in the community. And the community is excellent because uh, you have access to me, uh, a couple of times a month. Plus I bring in experts, uh, guest speakers from all over the world. Uh, and there anybody from scientists, uh, health uh, care uh, people, and uh, they come to the community. And if you're in the inner circle, part of the community you have access um, to um, uh, these people. So like, for instance, like I'm talking to you now, uh, we'll bring an expert in on a Zoom conference and you have a chance to ask questions of the like. And so it's a very, very good program that we're growing and, and it's a private community. So we get to say what we want to say without being censored. And Vivian so somebody, says, somebody mentioned a part of the community in the chat. Yeah, there's <laughs> like Vivian spoke up for you. Okay, okay, so Dr. Montgomery, someone is, um, 
asking about nitric oxide supplementation. And you did talk about nitric oxide. And I had a, an additional question on that. Is there a way to improve your nitric oxide production? So that's yeah. a two point question. Yeah. So supplementation, supplementation are tricky. Uh, we use a precursor, L-citrulline, uh, as uh, a precursor. Some people use L-arginine uh, as nitric oxide uh, precursors to, to improve nitric oxide production. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. We like to uh, uh, utilize uh, things such as infrared sauna, for instance, helps the body produce nitric oxide. Um, uh, external counterpulsation, uh, that uh, bed that we use, and you see in our, you'll see it demonstrated in our docking series, that helps with the production of nitric oxide. Uh, of course, consuming lots of greens, dark leafy greens. I mean, it's a great way of doing it. Uh, you know, Dr. Esselson likes to talk about putting vinegar on it, but, you know, chewing leafy greens with nitrites and allows uh, uh, the body to produce nitric oxide. So we like to encourage people to use multiple uh, mechanisms uh, that can happen, that can work synergistically to help the body produce nitric oxide. Does, Dr. Montgomery, does that include smoothies? You know, smoothies, we use smoothies a lot. Uh, now, in some of our very acutely ill patients, uh, you know, smoothies are very helpful. Cold pressed juices are very helpful. Um, if you want to get into some of the technical aspects of things, because oftentimes people say, well, ask me if, uh, is cold pressed juice or cold pressed juices better than smoothies or vice versa? Uh, they both have the advantages. Uh, some people are not very good at cleaning juices, and so smoothies may be easier to, to make. Uh, cold pressed juices, if you're using a truly cold pressed juice and not a centrifugal juicer, may have an advantage because you're not oxidizing the, the produce uh, uh, as much, if at all, uh, with a cold pressed juicer compared to a blender, which may oxidize. Uh, the greens, which you may lose some of the nutritional value of, of the greens. Um, having said that, we uh, use a lot of smoothies. We use a lot of smoothies with detox. The patient that I, I presented was on a smoothie detox. So that seven days, she was, uh, I think for about five out of those seven days, she was only on smoothies. And maybe day six and seven, we had a few salads because she started feeling better and she wanted to, to chew on something. But but we have a lot of patients who put on those smoothie feasts and our heart failure patients do very well with it because uh, a smoothie or cold pressed juice, uh, you absorb nutrients without the work of breaking down food. And oftentimes these individuals, they have you know, gut edema due to the heart failure and inflammation. Uh, somebody with inflammatory bowel disease or any other kind of acute inflammatory condition will benefit from a smoothie feast or cold pressed juice feast because it allows the body to, to absorb nutrients uh, without having to uh, break down the nutrients and without having to chew. The, the, the patient that you mentioned uh, in your presentation, did, was, she, was she in the sauna? Did, did you have them? We, so we didn't get her to the sauna uh, because she was in the hospital, uh, but she's someone we would add to the sauna. You know, Once they get out, uh, we'll have them in sauna. And at that time, we weren't doing ozone therapy, which is another adjunct. Uh, we've had some difficult patients that we, uh, we lost because you know, we didn't have all the modalities like sauna and ozone therapy. And we've had ozone uh, therapy and fusion, which uh, uh, acts synergistically with the food. Uh, some individual we, lose on, we, use, we leave them on a raw diet for longer uh, because it takes a longer period of time to, to detox. And these patients are very complex. They, they have hypercoagulable state. Had the one patient had arrhythmias and, and was having embolization. Uh, lots of patients have frequent blood clots and we have to do things. We may add a natural kinase along with an anticoagulant to break down fibrin and, and also decrease clot formation to break down clots. So there's a lot of complex things that we're doing with these patients because you know, they may have renal dysfunction, liver dysfunction. Once you get into the slippery slope of multi-organ dysfunction, uh, we really have to hit them with a variety of things. Thank you. Um, medication, I'm sorry, medication weaning is also a very important thing. And so that's one thing, as, as I mentioned in that case presentation, we weaned her from medications. And that was the weaning from medication. Oftentimes people think, well, weaning from medications is 
is uh, a result of them getting better. And, and, and I won't argue that. However, I will say that the weaning of the medication contributes to them getting better. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double edge there. So weaning medication is a necessary thing. And it's not something that we do to be cute, show off, because uh, I, I take that to heart, that weaning medication is part of the therapy. What, you know, it's, it's, it, I wrote that down when you were talking about the case study that it was nutrition and it was weaning off medication. That, that was really exciting to, to hear those two things going together like that. We have yeah. a medical student that's, that's here and yeah. he wanted to learn more about plant-based eating and how it can help patients. Yeah. Do you have some recommendations where he should go to learn more or she should go? In terms of learning about plant-based nutrition? And medicine. And medicine, yeah. You know, there are a number of approaches. T. Colin Campbell Foundation has a certified course she can take. Uh, many of you may know about that. That's an excellent program. But I think one thing to do is just to call around. I mean, she can reach out to us, look at what we're doing, uh, the T. Colin Campbell Foundation, um, the uh, Neil Barnard uh, program up in uh, D.C., uh, the, the Neil Barnett Clinic, uh, they do some things. So um, that's something that, uh, um, that she can, they can look around and find some people and, and just go and, and do a, a talk. Okay, another question is um, from Rebecca. She is having a TEE and stent tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. My blood work showed potassium at 3.2 range is 3.6 to 5. Should the potassium be brought up? I have heart murmur, aortic stenosis, type 1.5 diabetes with A1C of 6, stiffness of lower heart muscle, chronic chest pain, heaviness, lightheadedness. Wow. Yeah, that's. Um... Uh, there's a lot going on. And while I won't give medical advice in this saying, I, I will say that I generally like to have my patients with electrolytes in normal range before I do a procedure. <laughs> I'll say that much. But, but that's something she should bring to the attention of the doctors and make sure that they're aware of that electrolyte abnormality and make sure that they, you know, uh, do something to correct that. Um, do you use herbs along with your nutritional plans? We do have herbs. Uh, we, we have begun working with an herbalist, uh, and we're going to start to do some things with herbs uh, in addition to, and again, you know, when someone says herbs, I mean, a lot of the food, the recipes we have, have herbs in them. So, you know, it's, you know, we look at herbs as part of the spectrum of food, uh, if you will. Dr. Montgomery, there's a question in the chat box about a uh, recommendation for a make and model of cold press juicers, which, which would you think, or what do you use with your patients? You know, the, the Nama juicer is a cold press juicer. They just came out with a new open, larger uh, opening where you can uh, put fruit through so that it adds to the efficiency. That's the one that we currently have. Um, um, the other cold press juicer, the Omega Vert, uh, is an auger, which behaves like a, a cold press juicer. Uh, somebody put in the chat, Nama, uh, the Nama J2. Um, and, you know, the, the, I think they probably still sell the uh, Norwalk juice. I think it's probably one of the original ones, uh, the cold press juices. But I think yeah, there are a number of good ones on the market. We currently use the, the Nama juice, but I'm sure there are others. You know, the, um, oh boy, we used to have the Green Star juicer. Uh, that had the magnetic uh, augers and that of course those the magnets were thought to decrease the oxidation when it grinded the, the produce. Um, we had a question about um, you know your intervention is really important when they're like your case study I mean things are serious but eventually they get to eating whole foods and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how you implement that? That's a good question. And the the you know, over the years, you know, we've learned. I mean, we've learned the hard way because, you know, 
you can only detox for so long. And at some point he says, okay, well, well, how do I do this? And that's why we had to put a restaurant on our site and a nutrition center at a grocery store. Now the grocery store is in its early days. However, we work with our patients at the full spectrum of food procurement because people want to prepare things themselves. Um, we, our new manager of our nutrition center, who happens to be my son, uh, has done an excellent job. He's uh, brokered a deal with a, uh, an organic uh, regional uh, food distributor, uh, and we're going to we're working with them to allow our patient order produce directly from them through our site. Uh, uh, we also bring in things in our grocery store because when patients go to these so-called health food stores, there's a lot of junk there. Uh, and so our vision in terms of helping people transition is to help them, you know, procure ideal foods. You know, these are the, you know, you may get some gluten-free, um, um, rice-like material or various other things that doesn't have preservatives. So when they go to eating whole foods, we help them make that transition by A, getting the supplies, having the supplies there. And then they, by either getting it from us or seeing it with us, they can learn how to search for these types of products and prepare these types of foods. Uh, we have a grocery plan and also a BICC plan where patients can sit with our nutritionists and we can help them plan their journey with recipes and, and the like. Uh, we, uh, are going to be implementing uh, cooking classes later on for some of our members in the next few months. So we work with them through the spectrum of food because we realize uh, that, you know, yes, detox has a major impact and we've lost patients because when they make that transition, they go back to the old ways. And so we've worked hard to create a process to help them sustain that. And that, that process continue, extends with the community we ship food all over the country uh, and, and we do a lot of different things to work with our patients and clients to help them, you know, maintain uh, the optimal nutritional regimen. There's one gentleman that comes to mind who was, who was hospitalized in a heart failure, I think in a, in a hospital somewhere in North Carolina. Uh, he had congestive heart failure. And, uh, you know, he looked us up online and reached out and, you know, ordered food and we shipped food to the hospital. Uh, he was on the transplant list. We shipped food to the hospital. He got better, got off. And then he uh, <clears throat> was able to uh, <clears throat> uh, get food shipped to the house. And so, you know, he, he did well. So, you know, there's a lot of different things. We have, you know, some online programs, our Jumpstart program online. It's free. You can get on and do a detox. A gentleman from Australia used our 10-day Jumpstart over a period of, I think, 30, 40 days to detox and clean the system out. So we have a lot of different tools and, and different things we've developed and we're still working to develop more to help people, you know, uh, wherever they are and in, in, in whatever capacity of illness they may be in. Dr. Montgomery, I think we have one final question here. And when you were talking about processed foods earlier, what are your thoughts on tempeh and tofu? Um, are those okay to, to consume? Yeah, so we we do have some tempeh products uh, in our, our our grocery store. We don't use a lot of tempeh products, but we have some, and um, and I think they're fine. I think you can use them. Uh, tofu, uh, oftentimes, and I'm careful when I talk about it because oftentimes the soy products are very processed. You know, uh, there are lots of dishes that are are fried. Uh, and so you have to be careful with those types of foods, uh, but that could be the case with any kind of plant-based food. So uh, we, uh, you know, once someone's beyond the, the detox phase of eating cooked foods, we do have recipes that use tempeh. We use a gluten-free tempeh. We have a preference for, you know, foods that, that are, have low or no gluten. The exception for the gluten would be the Ezekiel bread, which we allow have in our grocery store. There's also a local uh, a company that has a fermented bread that's that's not gluten-free, but all the, the grains are fermented and sprouted or fermented. So those are the only exceptions to the gluten, but we typically mm -hmm. use a gluten-free uh, tofu or tempeh, rather. 
Okay, Dr. Montgomery, you have been so generous with your time and your presentation was absolutely awesome. Um, we do have a, a present coming to you. Unfortunately, it's not going to be there until either the 5th or 6th of April, but knowing you have that market, um, we, or I, I'll guess I'll say, I thought this would be really great. Meet me at the farmer's market. So I, I hope it. you do some cooking yourself. Yes, I, I'll, I'll have to wear that and take a photo and send it back to you. <laughs> please do, please. But remember, and it's going to your office and it will arrive the 4th or, or the 5th or 6th of April, okay? But thank you so very much for doing this. And, um, and Stephanie, I appreciate you connecting us with Dr. Montgomery. You are great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And, um, you know, hats off to you, the great work that you're doing. Uh, keep up the great work because it's a community of us. And, and um, uh, I'll certainly continue to promote the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.